Hello and welcome to episode 201 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, how are you doing, buddy? Are you good? Yeah, I'm good, Andy. I'm, I'm very good, actually, because we've got something to celebrate, haven't we, this week? Rather than us sit there and say to each other, what have we been up to? We've been toasting a, an award, haven't we? We're award winners. We're not, we're, we're, we've, we've been nominated before, but we're, I'm very pleased to say that, yes, we are award winners. I'll let you tell the listeners what we've won. We're, we're an award-winning podcast. Now, there is a set of awards that occur that uh, every year. That there's a group called the UK Money Bloggers. They have an award ceremony which is sponsored by quite well-known companies. You name a, a retail company out there or website, they'll sponsor award investment companies like Schroder's. And they've actually been, been able to build it up into quite a, quite a thing. And I know we're not money bloggers or anything anymore. I know Money to the Masses back in the depths of time started that way but they then created a podcast category just to celebrate podcast money podcast generally so pete matthew is often is nominated in the category he won it last year in fact and other well-known podcasts that people who listen to this podcast do when we had our meetup they named some of the other podcasts and anyway they had the award ceremony for this year and we won andy didn't we we are we were named the best money podcast in the uk put in pete matthew into second place which was uh, if you're going to beat a podcast a money podcast pete is the one to to beat so yep that was nice to receive that and uh, thank you to the sponsors of that who actually i think was schroder's funny enough but um yeah i don't think they would particularly like me because i sent out a tweet about two days later laughing at something that they were doing as a business model and uh, <laughs> 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 they're, they're teaming up with lawyers to launch a, an advice service um, to fill the advice gap and I joked as if that was going to solve the problems but it's really good to so award winners Andy and that's very nice to have that recognition but all we really like is the recognition of our listeners so leave us a review I just go on to one other thing to mention in terms of us and audiences on Tuesday this week so we listen into this podcast it's Sunday maybe or Monday on Tuesday the 27th of November I'm taking part in a panel discussion in London, it's near King's Cross, um, about investing. So it's aimed at people who want to get into investing, maybe already are investing. And what's happened, a fund management group has created this forum, as it were. So this is an audience of up to about, I think it's about 80 to 100 people can go. And it's free to go. And there'll be four panellists, and they'll be talking about investing, answering questions. And I'm one of those people, and they'll be interviewing us as well. So Go check out our Facebook page. So go onto Facebook and look for Money to the Masses because I've pinned the information for that event to the top of our Facebook page. Now it's free to go. So if you can register, you can just rock up, you get some free booze and you'll probably get some wonderful insights from me and the rest of the panel. It's well worth going. If you do decide to go, then do let me know. And Or even if you don't get the chance to because it's a last minute thing, then do say hello as you come into the event because I'll be there from six o'clock being a panelist but the main event starts from 6 30 and they have a you know an intro etc and i think it really kicks off at seven so if you're in the area on tuesday evening then um, do come along and listen to us because they're going to do breakout sessions so it's not just you listening to us waffle on that bit only lasts about 25 minutes the next hour or so you get the chance to go and have breakout sessions with each panelist to talk about whatever you want so come say hello and we can talk about anything but anyway enough of the admin i suppose yeah no that's good is that the first time they've done it or the first time you've been involved i haven't heard of you doing this before no they've tried to get me to do one before and i decided i'll do this one actually because i want to get out and do lots more interactive talks and um, discussions and things and partly because when we did our meetup recently it was so much fun and everybody gave such good feedback and we got such good feedback in terms of what people like and do you know what I mean just interacting with people that kind of feedback into seeing your the audience that was really good and one of the things to go out and meet people is far better than just talking into silence so 
I wanted to go out and do lots more of that. And just to, it's great, great to be able to hear people's real life questions because they make great fodder for content and also to know that you're channeling what you're doing and providing solutions that, to problems people have. So yeah, I've done this the first time. I'm not saying that necessarily I'll do it again. We'll see. They are going to do subsequent events and there is going to be a, a YouTube video of the event at some point. So if they do that, then no doubt I will uh, share it on social media. Excellent stuff. So if you go into that, you'll be able to uh, see and hear Damien. But on to the just hearing Damien bit, onto the podcast. What have we got coming up on this week's show? Right, we got three pieces. One of them I'm going to talk about is an investment piece, bonds. Now, this is called credit spreads. If you've ever wondered or heard the word or phrase, I should say, credit spreads, then I'm going to explain it. But more importantly, it's an indicator of some kind of to the possibility of trouble ahead for the economy and the stock market and it's the latter that's probably most interesting at this point in time because while the stock markets are having a bit of a wobble this indicator and stuff you'll hear about credit spreads is going to be useful as an evergreen piece of content so whether it's now or in 10 years time when we probably have another financial crash then it will be useful the other pieces are a question i'm asked regularly so I'm going to give people the answer is where to save £100,000 of money. Basically, if you have a big lump sum of money, how do you get the best interest rate on it? There's some new, quite interesting uh, services that have been created recently. So I'm going to mention and talk about one or two of those. And the last one, uh, in last week's podcast, I talked about the property market, if you recall. Hmm. And we got some good feedback. and It's, it's a topic I've not covered extensively for a while and um, what I thought I would do is give people a bit of an update on the state of the property market going into 2019 but also explain how they can find out that information going forward so in the future years because there's a good source of trying to get a, a bit of a dipstick and see where the property market is from a sort of consumer's perspective but also from an agent's perspective okay so we're going to start with credit spreads now i've not heard of this before um, and that's the beauty of me doing this podcast because there's lots of things i haven't heard of before and so you're telling you're educating me as much as you're educating our dear listeners so credit spreads what what, what are we talking about now bonds okay so we have equities as one end of the spectrum for investing so the riskier stuff and down the other end, the lower risk stuff, we have bonds. And bonds are effectively loans. So the way to think of them, they are loans usually to a government or a company. So corporate bonds are effectively a loan to a company. And you get things like gilts, which are loans to the UK government, or treasuries, which are loans to the US government. So they are a low risk type of investment. But when I say they're a loan, what really happens is that you may buy, let's just say you had lots of money and you paid hundred thousand pounds as a bond to a company what you're really doing is giving them a hundred thousand pound and you're getting a regular fixed income stream hence the name fixed income is used to describe bonds for a period of time let's say 10 years 20 years and then you get your original capital back now that is how it works it's effectively a loan but they're tradable so you don't really feel like that that you're buying a loan it's just like this investment product and of course bond funds you can invest with very small amounts you could have 50 pounds and invest in the bond fund because the bond fund itself run by a manager has millions and billions of pounds worth of money in it and they have all these bonds in there and you just buy into that particular fund now bond markets are quite an interesting beast because despite what people might think bond markets are where the real action occurs it's not exciting action you're not seeing necessarily things whiz up and down like equity markets and it might not get the headlines on the news at 10 but bond markets are the biggest markets in the world it's where the big boys go it's imagine you're sort of playing poke around your living room table you're rocking up to the casino to the big boy table that's the bond market that's where the institutions place their big bets and the serious money is going on in the bond market now often equity markets and bond markets have some form of correlation it usually is that they move in opposite directions not in lockstep but when equity markets tend to crash bonds tend to fare better because money goes out of equities as people panic and they buy something safer namely bonds equally when the opposite happens when everyone's feeling very optimistic they might sell out of bonds and they might buy equity so they're good diversifiers but they also behave because the way they behave and because of the way the types of people who really invest heavily in those markets i.e the institutional investors particularly in bond markets 
retail investors don't go in heavily with big bets on bond markets. They buy bond funds, but I'm talking about the real big boys, the investment banks, etc. They can give quite interesting indicators, leading indicators to trouble in the stock market. So it's, think of it as an analogy. I, I use this analogy this week when I write quite extensively about it in the 8020 Investor newsletter this week. But I want to just use it in the podcast this week to give people a bit of understanding. If you imagine certain things in the bond market, and in this case, I'm going to talk about credit spreads. I will explain what they are. They're a bit like having high blood pressure. So it's showing you've got high blood pressure. And of course, high blood pressure can cause a heart attack. And we're talking about a heart attack in the stock market. So it's a the credit spread is one indicator that you people look at that can show there could be trouble ahead in equity markets. And the reason that is, is because if you understand how bond markets work, a bond, obviously, if you're taking out a bond, depending on the person who effectively that loan goes to, that dictates the yield you get. So think of it simply, if someone is very risky and unlikely to ever pay back that final instalment or any of the agreed interest, you're going to want a bit more money. It's like if you've got a mate who you lend some money to, you're going to want to get something back a bit more just to offset the fact he might not pay you anything up front. Do you mean in the end, you might want a little bit yeah. more back up front. So it works the same way with bonds. You get a better yield, a better interest rate. And of course, the safest people to lend to are governments like the UK and America. So the yield you tend to get on those, which are called investment grade bonds or debt, is relatively low compared to, say, certain corporate bonds. So to companies, you could be McDonald's or Coca-Cola who might issue bonds. And so depending on the company, if they're very high risk, the yield is higher. So it's called high yield. So you can see there's a differential between those yields. So you're going to get ones that are a bit more risky, you're going to get a higher yield. The ones that are lower risk are going to get a lower yield. So think of it like interest rates. Now what happens is the difference between what is a low risk investment, so lending to say the government, the US treasuries we're going to use in this example, and maybe a high yielding bond which is to a particular company that may be a bit more of a risk of going defaulting, that difference in yield is called the credit spread. Right. So that is the credit spread. And you're looking at bonds of similar maturities, but it's down to the fact relating largely to the credit worthiness because you'd hope the US government isn't going to go bust. But what happens is that if you think supply and demand dictates the price movements of bonds, okay, just like anything in life. If more people want something, the price goes up. But there's an interesting quirk of bonds the way they're priced if the price goes up because the return is the income payments are fixed the yield that you actually get goes down so you don't have to fully understand that but just if the demand for a bond so people want more of it so the price goes up the yield you get goes down very simple terms if you paid 50 pound for an income stream and I paid £100 for that same income stream, my yield is going to be half of what yours is, isn't it, Andy? I've paid yeah, twice as it. much. Yeah. So it's that kind of idea. What it means is that when institutional investors, when the big boys come wading in, and they're feeling really happy with life, they think the economy is going to boom. There's going to be hardly any any companies going bust because the, the world is rosy. They're really aggressive. They want to take on risk. What they will do is they will probably sell down their large treasury holdings, those bonds, those loans to the U US government, and they'll go into the riskier stuff. Yeah. So what that means is the price of the riskier bonds rises due to demand. What that means, as I just explained, is the yield on those starts to fall, doesn't it? The high, the high yield stuff starts becoming, because of demand, the yield starts falling. So you can see the difference between that what was a high yield bond and the treasuries narrows. So it's the narrowing is a suggestion that everybody's happy. They're being very bullish. They're aggressive. The economy's looking great. So that is an indicator that everything's fab. But equally, if we go the other way, where the economy looks a little bit, mm, we're not sure, but particularly if there's a risk off sentiment that people are suddenly panicking what they'll do, they'll sell those higher riskier bonds and they'll buy the really secure ones. And so it makes the price of the high riskier ones fall, makes their yield go up. On the opposite side, when people are buying the safer treasuries, their price goes up and their yield goes down. So that credit spread, that difference, that, that what happens, that widens. And it's in a, in, only in times of very of stress that that happens. So the reason I mention this is because 
the widening of the credit spread in bond markets has been an indicator often that there's going to be trouble in the stock market and in two if you go back to i think it was 2011 there was one in 2015 but importantly 2007 that credit spread that basically high blood pressure that alarm went off in bond markets before the heart attack happened in the u.s stock market yeah. and what we've got is that we've started to see elements of that now but if you go back to early 2018 when the markets the stock market went all bandy and it all went a bit sort of pear-shaped for a period of time if you looked at the bond market those credit spreads they weren't widening they weren't showing any panic they were actually saying that the institutional money was pretty okay with what was going on so there wasn't alarms going off so you just think well maybe it was just a bit of a heart flutter rather than a heart like a fatal heart attack for the stock market and what happened the US stock market did rebound and it then went to new all-time highs and so looking at you'll start hearing maybe credit spreads or even if you don't start googling credit spreads and start seeing what people are talking about them and so at the moment the credit spreads have started to widen in the last week or so and unusually so they hadn't done up until this point in the october sell-off so the fact that they have then sort of suggests well we've got to be paying attention is the bond market starting to tell us something and people don't necessarily notice so it's one of those things that you might um you want to look in the bond market to maybe confirm something that might happen in the in the in the u.s stock market it doesn't mean it's not solely cause and effect but it's just the fact that it's the it's the if they widen quickly more than normal because actually in 2018 early 2018 despite the stock market tanking the credit spreads were generally narrowing so it was actually showing conversely that people the the smart money was fairly okay with what was going on there wasn't panic they weren't panicking just yet and then the market stock market turned the corner so anyway credit spreads i think i've explained something that is actually quite complicated i'm hoping i got that across to everybody so google credit spreads and if it widens you know that that might be a bit of a harbinger for doom for the u.s stock market or whichever stock market you're looking at before we move on andy i just wanted to quickly mention 8020 investor now 8020 investor is my diy investment service do go and check it out i empower and teach people how to invest their own money the service provides data-driven fund tables the data is driven by my own unique 8020 investor algorithm which i created you also get stop loss alerts you get research articles and insights you get market commentaries monthly commentaries and diy investment lessons but you also get access to my fifty thousand pound portfolio which is a portfolio of my own money which i run live on the site for members to see and it shows people how i use the service to uh, maximize my returns and in the first two years of doing so i turned fifty thousand pounds into fifty nine thousand five hundred pounds which is a a 19 percent return beating investment managers professional fund managers financial advisors investment banks passive trackers in the market so everybody can have a free 30-day trial of 8020 investor and you can claim that by going to moneytothemasses.com and going and clicking on the 8020 investor hyperlink at the top of the page so go and try the service let me know what you think of it and i i know from the feedback that you're going to love it but for now on with the show Okay, so Damien, this is a question you get asked a lot. People have got £100,000. What do they do with it? What should they be doing with £100,000? Yeah, I mean, this is to do with savings. Now, this could be people come into money. That's quite often where it comes from. They've inherited money, sold a property for quite a bit of profit, downsized or whatever. And there are people who just don't want to be in the stock market or investing in anything. And so, yeah, we'd all like to have £100,000 um, and be lots of people listen to this podcast thinking well, I mean, that's a that's a nice problem to have but what do you do with it because at the end of the day it's a decent sum of money and, and the principle is the same whether it was a hundred or ten thousand pounds and I've gone with a hundred because that is the point where people really start getting a bit sort of tetchy about they they're, they're really worried about the percentage because fractions of a percent of nothing is nothing but a few percentage points on a hundred thousand is a decent amount of money so I just want to quickly run through the key things that you should do. So first of all, if you're going to go and have £100,000, what are you going to do with it? You're going to shop around. So you can go on the Best Buy tables at 
all sorts of sites. We have them on Money to the Masses that are independent. We, we um, have best buys on all sorts of things, cash ices, fixed rate, bonds, etc. We You go and have a look at them, even child savings accounts. Um, ch- child savings, children's savings accounts, I should say. So we've got all of those things. So go and look at those tables. The thing is, you've got to be careful when you look at the banks who are providing them. You want to make sure they're covered by the financial services compensation scheme. So if they go bust, you get your £85,000 of your money back. So if you've got one hundred grand, you're going to have to split your money with probably two institutions to get it fully covered. Because don't forget, when the when we had the financial crisis and everyone thought banks were going to go bust, if you'd put one hundred grand with one bank and it went bust, you'd only get £85,000 back if it's covered by the financial services compensation scheme. So first of all, check that they are. Secondly, if you have a have existing accounts, check that they're not under the same banking license. So banks under the same banking license can share the same to say they have the same license. HSBC and First Direct are good examples. And that means that if you had eighty five thousand pounds with First Direct and eighty five thousand pounds with HSBC, if they both went bust, you'd actually only get one eighty five thousand pound because they're essentially the same bank but you have to look it up it's on the F- fca website or the financial services compensation scheme website one way you can get round the eighty five grand limit if you're happy to have a joint account with your wife or husband then that limit doubles for a joint account so it actually goes up to one hundred and seventy thousand so you could have one account with a hundred grand in that was joint and it would be covered fully under a bank or building society that was fully covered by the financial services compensation scheme obviously use your ISA allowance it's tax-free you can build that up over time by moving money into a ISA each year so that's 20 grand you can do you obviously get a savings allowance anyway every year so everyone has that personal saving that savings allowance we've talked about it in the past but it enables you to get up to about a thousand pounds worth of interest without any tax on it depends on your tax band though that will save you a bit of money but over time if you moved all of your money into um ices each year then you'd have it all tax-free which would be wonderful don't forget there's high interest paying current accounts there's a number of those that could pay up to five percent you could put a bit of money in one of those then you could also bear in mind the bonus rates and the terms. Now, if you look at any of the best buy tables that exist out there, there'll always be some caveat normally. You get a decent rate for one year, and then they absolutely cane you the next by knocking it off. You need to make sure you're aware of that, and any accounts that have those, you set dates in your calendar. Now, if you're a bit lazy to do that, there is a service out there called Rate Tracker by Savings Champion. If you Google it, you can find it on our website, on money to the masses in fact what this piece here has inspired a piece of content on the site if you go onto our website and you look for the best savings account for a hundred thousand pounds search that in the search bar you will see a really fully fledged in-depth piece on this topic so you can find out a bit more then anyway but yeah make sure you check the bonus rates but the service like rate tracker what they do is they actually you give them your email and they alert you when there's better rates in the market than the one you're on and they will keep checking all the time and keep alerting you. So it's a bit like the energy saving club you get at Money Saving Expert with energy deals. This is kind of a version that's like that but for saving. So it's quite, it's good and it's free. The other thing you could do is consider peer-to-peer lending. Now peer-to-peer lending is it cuts out the middleman. So if you think a bank, you give money to a bank, the bank gives you a, a NAF savings rate. They take that money They chop it up, they lend it to somebody somebody else, whether it's mortgages or whatever, loans, and they take a higher rate or charge a higher rate of interest on those loans and they make the bit in the middle. Well, peer-to-peer lending takes out the bank, so it effectively allows you to lend to people directly. And they, they slice and dice up the loan, so it's not necessarily you're lending money to John Smith down the road. It's anonymized, so the people you're necessarily lending to, you won't know. It's split up in tranches. But it does mean you can get higher rates of interest. Now, I know rate setter are doing a deal where you can get 6.5% a year. Now, there are caveats, and they are even offering a £100 bonus if you put in a grand up front so that's quite interesting but the big thing you have to be aware of is peer-to-peer isn't covered by the financial services compensation scheme so any money you put in there and they go bust and it all goes wrong you'll lose it now they do have protection funds they do try and create their own in-house version of a safety net a safety buffer they've never had to that's always always been sufficient for any loans that went bad effectively so that regard i've been in and talked to them 
many moons ago about it and it, I was quite impressed to be honest but you have to be aware of that so I wouldn't put all my money in a little bit of your money that's fine that just nudges up the overall amount of money you earn in total on your your pot just on a few thousand but then you've got to be realistic and be accepting of the risks but they do now do an ISO you can now have this kind of stuff inside an ISO which you couldn't a year or two ago so that's quite interesting I just want to throw out finally a couple of services that may be of interest to people now if you feel lazy and you want someone else to do all the work for you then savings champion do have a service that you can it's like the concierge service they used to call it i think they changed the name now cash advice service or something and they do all the legwork for you all the shopping around filling the application forms make sure you're covered by the compensation schemes and all that hard work but they will take a little slug of your interest for the like a fee so they will make sure you get a good rate so you can have a look at that it's free to have a chat to them so look, look at savingschampion.co.uk you'll find them but there are new services that are coming out which are quite interesting Hargreaves Lansdowne has launched a cash service so if you're on their platform already they have a service whereby you can invest cash into savings accounts so rather than have best buy tables they have like their own table of uh, savings products that are usually, uh, I think they the lowest, the, the shortest is three months term, and I think it can go up to five years. And what they do is you invest just through Hargreaves Lansdowne, so you have this active savings account, and they're very clever, very shrewd, because what they've done is they've you while your money goes through to the actual accounts that you might see on the Best Buy tables and some of the um, comparison sites. That it's all done on Hargreaves Lansdowne, so they're you're almost anonymized if that makes sense. Hargreaves Lansdowne still owns you as a client, and it's very clever because what it does, it means that at a click of a button you can switch, and we don't have to keep filling forms in. So you go on, you register, you put your hundred grand in there, and you can go right. I want that account. That one's got a good rate. And you click the button, and off it goes. And then when the term ends, they notify you, and you can click a button and go. Right, I'm going to send it over there now to that one. That's got a good rate for six months. And it's it's a clever idea. What they're really trying to do is get people's money onto their platform because then they can start charging and making money and get you to invest. But it's quite a good service for people. It's like the halfway house, but having someone run your money for you. But it's also they, they they don't do it for you, but they select the best. They make it easy. But it yeah. it does mean you don't have all the best buys. But they do have some good rates. I've looked at them. So that's quite interesting if you're on Hargreaves lands lands down already they claim they're going to try and get other providers on there rather than just the half a dozen they have now the downside is you can't have your pension you can't use that service in your pension or within an ISA it's a separate thing which is therefore not benefiting from any tax free structure and the other one to have a look at is raisin so yeah raisin is in the is in the fruit they, they've come to the UK, they're a European outfit, and what they've done, they've come to the UK and they work by a similar model to what I've just described for Hargreaves Lansdowne, but they allow you to be able to invest in different multiple accounts, similar way, it's not quite as, I, I don't, from what I've seen, and we, we've, if you go on the site, we've reviewed it, and um, we've had a look at how it works, the, the rates aren't necessarily the best in the market, but it works in a similar way that cuts out that sort of searching the, the too much of the paperwork but it allows you to have a look at different rates so if you're not going to shop around and you're not bothered about getting necessarily the best the Hargreaves new offer and Raisin are worth looking at to see if you want to try them but it's a relatively new thing in the UK the Raisin but it has been around for a while in Europe so I've just thought I'd throw them out there you can like all things you can find out more info on the website moneytothemasses.com excellent moves us on to the last piece and we touched on it last week and you had some feedback uh, property what have we got this week well on the property front it's interesting because with Brexit going completely um, well, I don't know what's happening with Brexit, to be quite fair. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think does. Theresa May does, to be fair. I, I don't think anyone does. It's it's like uh, Danny Dyer said, it's all a mad riddle. I mean, he did he did he did throw in a few more expletives to um yeah. to, to to that quote, and he also talked about David Cameron sitting with his trotters up and uh, watching it all unfold, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> uh, that's the funny thing with politics; you have to laugh almost. I mean, we don't get into politics, but I do have I have no idea where where Brexit's going. Like we said last week, about the impact on investments is quite significant. The value of the pound, we could see the pound crash. Oh. Just before I go on to this one, I did mean, or maybe I'll do it next week. Um, I'll try and remember 
But if you want to really... I told people, don't play the currency game of Brexit. You, you could get badly burned. But obviously, if people want to, there are you, you, there is a slightly more subtle way you can do it. About get, you get exposure to the currency rate, but without actually betting directly on the currency. It's a bet on a different. It's not betting. It's investing in a different type of asset. I we'll might definitely cover, cover that next week. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll when I'm editing this, I'll send you a little reminder so we can do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but what, but obviously with property, it's got is relevant because it's stopping people moving. I think there are a lot of people who would move but aren't going to move because they don't know what's going to happen, and they th- also hope the house prices might drop. Yeah, as as Mark Carney said. So there is a an interesting report that comes out by I, I'm, I'll name check them, but Zoopla, you know the property portal. Yeah, they do a state of the property nation report every year, and it it comes out in about November, so it's just come out for next year. So it's 2018, but it's looking into 2019 what the market's going to look like. So from an evergreen perspective for this podcast, it's quite interesting because what they do is they research and interview agents. I think it's something like 600 estate agents and thousands of consumers to, do, to pull together a quick snapshot of where we are on the property market so if you listen to this in the future you can find the latest one for the year that you're listening to um, by going to their website just google the state state of the property nation report and in a very quick snapshot 55 percent of consumers think house prices are going to go up in the next 12 months okay now i don't know about you what do you think andy i mean we might as well just stick our fingers in the air and guess but is your view yeah I, i'm i'm pretty much that i i I've got no idea. I'm actually in the um, in the market for a property in the next year or two, so I am keeping a keen eye, and I, and I hate to second guess it. I don't know. Possibly, I think it it is going slightly north, but as well, as a potential first time buyer, I'm hoping they keep on tumbling. Yeah, and the thing is, the estate agents, thirty nine percent of estate agents actually believe the prices will fall in the next 12 months and they right. reckon they're going to fall by at least eight percent so that's their view so while consumers are i mean consumers always think house prices are going to go up it's one of those things that they believe that well there's only one way over time property does tend to but that's like most things it's because inflation that's called inflation yeah i mean when you look if you if you talk to your grand she'll tell you she bought a house for a fiver I mean, yeah. uh, they forget that, that everything's relative. Don't yeah, they? everything's re- relative. Um, so what literally, it sh- what it's it, your grand. <laughs> <laughs> what it shows, though, is there's a real polarization in views, not just within the consumer and estate agents, but also within the consumers themselves. So the yeah. consumers are either really optimistic or they're really pessimistic. So it's not so much of a middle ground. And what we're also seeing is seven percent of people are putting their plans to move on hold compared to two years ago, and it's interesting as well when you looked at they asked the state agents what was their most the thing they're worried about at the moment and they also compared it back to previous years in 2016 they were most worried about the the economy and the impact that was going to have on their business as estate agents and the market last year 2017 it was they didn't have enough stock because basically everything then went sort of gangbusters again and everyone was happy and everyone started buying and i know that from talking to people i know in the industry yeah. they were really doing well again because the brexit sort of wobble that happened after the referendum calmed down but of course as we go into the showdown into the home stretch of the of the brexit negotiations that has now the the economics has now reared to its head again as their most their biggest concern so that's just as a it's just interesting i think what we're going to get there for is come whatever happens with brexit it's going to be a that's probably going to determine what happens a lot with the market going forward. But then I've spoken to other people and they said they had quite a good November estate agents that things seem to have picked up a bit, whether that's a, a rush before Christmas. Um, that's Black Friday, isn't it? That's what it is. Oh, I'll tell you what, Black <laughs> Friday. Did you, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they, they would have seen a tweet that I, I sent out that actually was quite popular that showed you how you can block phrases on Twitter. I didn't know you could do it. You can block people, but you can block words. So any okay. uh, any any tweet with that word in is blocked from your timeline. And if you so I hashtag Black Friday and blocked it, and and showed people how you, how you could do it. And so I didn't have any Black Friday stuff in my social media, which I loved. Brilliant. Just finishing off this then. So the um the big theme, one of the big themes of 2019, they think is the first time buyers are going to come roaring back. They think there's going to be much more stuff to do with first time buyers. The other thing they noted is that. People, it's all still about location, location, location. And 40% of families know exactly which street they want to live in. 
and where they want to live, which is probably all down to sorts of things like schools, etc. But people are very specific that they know where they want to go. And generally, that's about 31% of people. So, wow. so I didn't realise that people were quite that. No. Um, I mean, having said that, if I was to move now, I'd probably be, be a bit more specific, but not because of a, I want to live in that street, but it will probably be down to schooling that you end up moving to go to find, uh, live closer to schools that you're, when your my daughter goes to secondary school, etc. So if I ever move, but that just proves that's what the market is. So yeah, the upshot is the market is polarized. The state agents aren't that optimistic about next year. And it's the ec- economics that are really the, the sort of pulling things back. And then once we get more Brexit clarity, then I think the world will be a far rosier place for a number of reasons. That's going to happen, is it? We're going to get Brexit clarity at some point? Well, I don't think we will. <laughs> I, I, Who knows? Because if the clarity is we just stay as we were, I think I've seen a number of Brexiteers rant at such saying, well, I'd, I'd rather just stay in. And you sort yeah, of think, well, well that, that didn't help, did it? But anyway, <laughs> each, everybody respect everyone's opinion of whether they want to be in, out or whatever. I, I just report the impacts. Exactly. We're not a political podcast. We're a money podcast. And I've very much enjoyed it this week, Damien. If you, the listener, would like to get in touch, then of course, Damien would love it if you do. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter, it's at moneytothemasses with the number two. And of course, review and love the podcast. Five stars would be great and share it and tell your family and friends because it's what helps us top the charts. And we're seeing some excellent numbers come through in the last few weeks. So yeah, give us a a like and a share and all that kind of stuff. Damien, we're pretty much done, aren't we? We are done, Andy. So um, until next week, make sure you follow me on social media. We're doing so much more. It's all, all good fun. So yeah, I think that's it, Andy. Till next week. Till next time. Don't forget to claim your free copy of Damien's best-selling book, The 30-Day Money Play. Sort your finances in just five minutes a day, worth $4.99. Just go to moneytothemasses.com slash podcast to find out how.